All right, then welcome everybody to this uh, all series of the Vienna Energy Law Forum organized as always by the Florence School of Regulation, the Energy Community Secretariat and the College of Europe. We are very happy that uh, in such a timely manner we managed to cover one of the packages that has been long awaited and is uh, finally out, uh, the gas package presented by the European Commission. This week, uh, presenting packages in one way has become business as usual. In a development which is anything but business as usual, the Green Deal and Europe's ambition to get fit for 2030, for 55 and then beyond also for uh, 2050. And um, as to be expected, this gas package is not only being seen now against the background of our decarbonization ambitions, but also against the background of a more recent development, the energy price surge that we all have been witnessing. It is a development where gas has been considered as a major driver. We witness uh, some old and some new players in this development, uh, a more globalized development than we were used to in Europe and this will definitely also determine and characterize the discussion that is to follow on the presented package. We are very happy, as I said, to be among the first ones maybe to have um, one of the key actors in preparing and presenting this package here today with us. We will look at uh, Augustine's presentation uh, as everybody else will in the weeks and months to follow from the perspective of how the gas package can and will contribute to the decarbonization of our, of our energy sectors and of our economies in Europe, but also how it will contribute to make the EU energy markets uh, more resilient towards developments uh, of the kind that I just mentioned. And coming from the energy community, of course, we will also be very interested in understanding how this package will affect the relation of the European Union with its closest neighbors and how we can turn the European energy sector, the gas sector in particular, into a resilient decarbonized sector, help developing it further in this direction in a pan-European manner. I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, Mr. Augustin van Hasten who is uh, an ancien of the College of Europe. Uh, so that's a double pleasure uh, to have you here, who's also uh, very well acquainted with the energy community. We have been working together, I was then in uh, issues or on issues such as uh, the certification of the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline. And now he's also um, somebody who features on the Florence School of Regulation program. You are team leader decarbonization and sustainability of energy sources at uh, DG Enna in the European Commission. And we are very eager and looking forward to what you will present to us right now. Thanks. So maybe first a little step back. Uh, because we talk about the reform of uh, the gas markets. Um, um, everybody's focused on the 2050 ob uh, objective of um, net uh, zero. And uh, this means uh, many things, not just inside the energy sector, but also outside. Um, uh, and I think the first thing to mention is that uh, electrification is and remains uh, the first priority. Um, but the reality is is that not all processes uh, can be can be decarbonized by electrification technically or reasonably or not in time. That is basically the reason why in the projections which the Commission has presented at various occasions for 2050, there is a still a remaining role for gas. I should say gases. So today's Gas system, of course, is 95% uh, fossil gas. Renewable and low carbon gases play hardly any role. Um, but it is clear that if there is a role of gas uh, by 2050, then it has to be uh, a gas which is uh, decarbonized. So, um, so if you look at the projections in terms of uh, volume, or I should say maybe energy content, the, the role of gas is will be decreasing relative to uh, what it is today. 
it not that much as you would maybe initially uh, expect. But uh, what is very important uh, to emphasize is that the composition of the gas which we will still have by will be very different from what we have uh, today. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, when we talk about gas today, we speak about methane. Uh, methane will be continued to be around by 2050, but non-abated methane will no longer be around. And um, it will largely be replaced by uh, biomethane and other renewable gases which can be injected in the methane grid. But I think what is important to say to add that is that apart from the decarbonization of the existing network, we will also see the development of a parallel network of uh, pure or pure, let's say high grade hydrogen, uh, which is meant to decarbonize otherwise um, very difficult to decarbonize sectors and processes. And uh, one those which have read our hydrogen strategy know that there we focus on industrial applications and transportation. And, and this um, means also that uh, when we talk about um, gas, um, we, it's not just about the decarbonization existing network, but it is actually also about creating the possibility of alternative uh, pathways, basically. So the, the gas rules which we have today are the ones which were adopted in 2009. Uh, in the third energy package, uh, they were completely conceived uh, um, based on two pillars. We will have natural gas around, fossil gas, which will be imported uh, largely and they will be transported to end consumers on a one-way street uh, and used there. Um, and secondly, uh, it is of course primarily based on the notion that we have to create a market. And our objective and means to achieve, um, to achieve them have built change over time. So the I think one element there is uh, that uh, probably a larger share of the gases which we consume in Europe will be produced domestically by methane, clearly. Um, also um, uh, hydrogen from electrolyzers, if because the emphasis is on the green hydrogen, not just low carbon. And um, the, of course, the decarbonization objective has been added to the fact that we have to have a well-functioning market. And this changes both, both changes reasons to, to look at again at our with the current uh, gas regulatory framework and change it in, in various ways. Um, I don't know how long I should, how in much detail I should go, but I could uh, maybe give the broad overview after which you can come up with some questions. So first of all, I said um, we need to change decarbonized existing methane network. So that means that we have to create the conditions and to for biomethane to become part of the energy mix within the uh, network. And that means that uh, as they are often, the methane, biomethane productions is often centralizedly connected. It means that you create the conditions for the physical integration of biomethane in the network, but also to make sure it can be properly part of the gas market as we know today. So that has to do with adapting the rules to the fact that we will have different flows and different um, that's injection points within the existing network. Another important element is, of course, that biomethane as yet is not competitive with fossil uh, gas. So we also foresee some, um, let's say, some some rules to compensate for this uh, price differential, and that has to do with the rebates which we receive for low carbon and renewable gas within the methane network, and that so that means no cross border tariffs for those gases nor um, and, and rebates possible on other ejection points from for instance terminals and from storage. <coughs> um, so there will be an incentivizing effect possible within the tariff structure of the uh, natural gas network as we know today in order to foster its decarbonization. Another element uh, which needs to emphasize here is that uh, um, gases in the methane network will change the composition. Many people speak about injection of hydrogen and blending in natural, in the natural gas grid. This is something which, uh, from our perspective, uh, is not 
is maybe a, an, an element which can play a role in transition, but it's not a long-term solution. Uh, and it has to do with the application of hydrogen. It has to do with also, and that is something we all emphasize very much on that point, is that um, if we blend gas in a non-controlled or confined way in the natural gas grid, we will soon uh, have no longer an internal market for gas because the gas qualities uh, will differ so much that um, they will no longer be the, the cross border points will no longer be interoperable. So we propose a <coughs> kind of cap on cross border points. The cap is on cross border points, uh, which means that there is. Uh, there are relative large degrees of freedom of member states inside, inside, but not on the borders. And uh, the, the cap 5% relates to the fact that it's not a target. It is a threshold below which TSOs in country B, if they receive blended gas from country A, have to, have to accept uh, that blend. Uh, whereas above that threshold, that is no longer the case. And it has both to do with the fact that the at that way can accommodate to some extent the uh, blending in the um, in network without um, affecting the uh, internal market, but also that there is more clarity about who carries the costs of blending. Um, because above certain thresholds, the, the costs of uh, adapting in particular end applications are become prohibitively expensive. And so there should be also incentive structure, which means that those who cause the cost also carry it. Another element is um, uh, hydrogen. So here we don't speak about adaption of rules, we speak about new rules because the current gas directive does not foresee any kind of um, uh, pure hydrogen network. It does foresee uh, the possibility of blending. Um, uh, if you read really carefully Article 1B, I think, of the gas directive, uh, but it does certainly not foresee a dedicated hydrogen network. So we wanted to address this um, for various reasons. First of all, the repurposing of uh, existing natural gas infrastructure has very important uh, cost benefits if you want to build out a hydrogen network. So in order to make that possible, we have to facilitate it. Um, and uh, uh, like any uh, transportation of hydrogen by pipelines uh, has been established as, let's say, certainly within Europe, the more cost-effective uh, option. But uh, there are, of course, the same kind of, um, uh, let's say, economic externalities connected to that, which we know for electricity and gas networks, because you will have a natural monopoly in the value chain or you risk to create it, and that needs to be addressed. So there is a, uh, let's say, uh, but at the same time, when you speak about trying to define roles for hydrogen, we have to be, of course, very careful about the fact that this is an emerging sector and uh, which needs to develop from closely to nothing, basically, uh, to a mature uh, sector. So what in the rules for the hydrogen, um, we uh, remain high, higher level than the rules than we currently know for natural gas, although they are inspired by that, it should be said. And um, where we see a kind of two-stage development, uh, described also in the hydrogen strategy, a longer term perspective where, uh, where we have uh, rules for a sector which is more mature, let's say from of, as of two, 2013, uh, yet again rules which are adapted to the natural gas sector but are adapted to hydrogen both in terms of how we expect this sector to develop, i.e. what kind of access rules we need to dip to certain types of infrastructure for instance, but also we want to uh, take into account um, the, uh, the change in native production patterns, in particular if it's more domestically intra-EU produced. Uh, also here, like I already said in for low carbon, low carbon and renewable gases in the methane network, we also want upfront eliminate cross-border tariffs because um, those in fact create distortions on the production side within the EU. So 
to have a more level of playing field within the EU, it's better to upfront um, uh, um, make this uh, not possible so that we preempt this uh, from happening. And it is one of the examples, the other ones, where to some extent the fact that we regulate in a greenfield situation for hydrogen, we try to, um, uh, let's say, and that costs in order to impose certain rules are relatively low. Whereas we know from the gas and electricity side that imposing ex post rules are actually quite difficult and ex, uh, ex expensive. We try to make a great horizon of a, um, say, main regulatory principles, which are maybe maybe a bit even pure than we have for gas and electricity today. For instance, where we take a relatively strict line on unbundling, the unbundling rules, which we know uh, are the result of historical accident, in this way that uh, they were uh, the result of what was possible when you impose new rules on the existing sector, whereas now we can impose rules by, by, by uh, the level of vertical integration hydrogen, of course, is still very low. So by creating upfront clarity, we can actually, um, uh, let's say, move to a more, uh, let's say, a clear set of rules than we currently know in natural gas. Um, there's been a lot of debate. I don't know what it, I should ex develop it already here about when and to what extent we should allow for cross subsidies between various networks. So the solution uh, we um, uh, wrote into the, uh, in the, into the regulation is that um, uh, no, we will not allow for joint asset bases. They will be separate as from the start um, between hydrogen and natural gas. Um, but uh, we do allow for certain uh, financial flow between those regulated asset bases in order to compensate for the fact that once you repurpose a natural gas pipeline, um, this of course will only be filled uh, and have sufficient uses to set to justify its existence uh, with uh, some delay, and that some cross subsidies may be justified at that moment in time, but we clearly. I uh, see it as a temporary measure, and I should also add, it is an option for member states to allow this. And one of the conditions for uh, doing this is also that the costs of these cross subsidies cannot be imposed on neighboring countries, so that there's no externality there as well. Then there are indeed some then on consumers' rights. Um, those were already uh, changed uh, under the uh, electricity reform, market reform on the previous commission. Um, uh, nowadays, consumers, they don't buy electricity or gas, they buy energy. So it was the moment also where we could align the consumer rights for uh, gas to those which have already been changed for electricity. With this distinction that um, whereas for methane, uh, we have, of course, of course, we have many households connected. Uh, the rules were mirrored uh, to the extent uh, possible and necessary. As for hydrogen, basic consumer rights, yes, they are also being uh, deployed, but not um, consumer rights which connect to stimulating, facilitating a retail market for small and uh, small enterprises and households because they are not they are not expected to be certainly the uh, the pioneering customers in this sector. Then it's true as a result of the recent debate on high, high energy prices, there are also some measures connected to uh, the voluntary um, let's say to some improvements to the uh, security supply regulation which relate to uh, the voluntary joint procurement of strategic stocks of gas and um, improvements to the way the solidarity principle, which was deployed under the previous revision, can be made more practical. And um, let's say to also to strengthen the role of uh, storage within, uh, within Europe uh, to take uh, account of uh, the emergency situations. 
a lot of things to be said about uh, about it, like uh, also uh, network planning. But I think I've already overrun my time immensely. So maybe I should give an opportunity for questions and positions where you want to have it. Another element we forget is uh, definition certification of low carbon gases, which is also covered. Thank you very much indeed for giving us um, a very clear uh, picture of, of, of what's in the package um, and I think also stressing uh, some of the, the, the bigger the bigger issues in the in the package um, which paves the way for um, the questions uh, that my two colleagues are, are likely to ask. It strikes me that it must be um, a huge task at the moment for the Commission because First of all, you're working with a sort of kaleidoscope of, of legislation. There are so many measures um, with the Fit for 55 package, now the gas package. And of course, um, a lot of things will have to be developed further in the new taxonomy uh, mm -hmm. delegated regulation and uh, the state aid rules that are being finalized. It, it's, it's a, a really a moving picture. Um, so it's like looking, I find it's a bit like looking through one of those kaleidoscopes that if you change it a certain way, then the, the whole color changes and the whole way things fit together um, change before, literally before your eyes, just by a tiny adjustment. Um, and I, I think the other big challenge is that with the third package and the clean energy package, we were still very much in the mode of working to creating markets. But now we have to achieve a transition. And obviously, the very fact that we have this kaleidoscope of regulation indicates that the market isn't going to deliver that transition. I don't think, but maybe that's something uh, we can come back to. So we need um, this um, huge complex um, um, volume of regulation to get us to this transition. And that's in itself. I presume a huge challenge because if one bit changes in this entire picture, what does it mean for the rest of the package and the interrelated, um, the interdependencies um, uh, between all the different measures? I think it's going to be really interesting to see how the final versions uh, yes. develop. Anyway, with those few words, I'd like to turn the floor now to. Um, to Max um, and Thijs, and uh, Max is from the European University Institute, uh, writing his PhD on energy solidarity. Um, and Max is from the College of Europe, and Ma uh, they will both um, come up with some hopefully um, interesting questions. Thank you. Uh, but if I, if I can comment on, on what you just said, I think uh, it's very true. I think uh, the uh, it's rather complicated at the moment because the Commission has taken, I think, a quite well thought through strategy, but raises the legislative process under this, uh, turns this legislative process under this Commission a kind of two state rocket, where first high level objectives are being agreed and then the implementation is being done. Whereas normally, and it is difficult to keep together, but by having the, uh, the climate law and the strategy behind it, discussed and adopted first, it created the, the correct horizon for the more detailed measures to be uh, well tailored and adopted. Otherwise, it would not have been to keep it on, on one track. And it connects, our bit of work connects with the whole picture because um, I think you're trying to say that markets by themselves, they do not deliver decarbonization. The only one thing which markets are really good at it is to make sure that within the constraint they have to act, they do that at lowest cost. But of course, uh, decarbonization, especially of course when the, the decarbonized energy sources are not cost effective yet, uh, they will not come into the market. So we have to set the conditions for that to happen. So the incentivization uh, and price components, I think, were very much part of the July package, whereas our uh, work is more related to the enabling of this transition to happen and to make sure that the rules are adapted in such a way that the costs of what is being incentivized in our target for 2050 is the, is most cost effective, basically. That is maybe another way of it in the picture. Eagerly looking forward to the questions. I'd like to turn the floor now to the two the two examiners. So, uh, Max, I think you go first, and then Thijs. 
Thank you. That's right. Yes, and and thank you also for from from my side for so clearly uh, laying out the cornerstones of this this quite uh, quite substantial package. I think that it was was a good sort of uh, tour of 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 the main the main uh, innovations that this brings to the table. Uh, and I suppose our first, my first question relates to one of those innovations, and which is the, the the establishment of the European network of network operators for hydrogen, which uh, which the proposed regulation sort of brings on the way, starts a process towards the establishment of that network, um, and quite quite basically, quite foundationally, I, I just wanted to ask you, and you touched on it to some degree uh, before, but why exactly that decision at Commission level to establish a separate network for hydrogen? Why they have a separate network for hydrogen? Um, well, I think that has to do. Uh, you mean in terms of uh, governance structure or in terms of physical um, uh, network characteristics? In terms of of, uh, of governance structure, uh, ha having uh, uh, the the uh, NO uh, besides the ENSO uh, uh, networks. Well, I think uh, part of the answer is that. Um, uh, Let's say hydrogen is seen by many as uh, uh, a promising uh, energy factor, which in many ways I think it is. Um, but uh, I think we should also make sure that the rollout and the rules which are applicable to those networks um, are uh, proportional and fit for purpose. And when I say proportional, is the fact that uh, with the uh, progressively decreasing amount for methane, and uh, the fact that uh, part of our gas network uh, may become underutilized, um, uh, we should make, uh, let's say, repurposing and building a hydrogen network uh, should be based on actual demand. Uh, and it should not be an easy route uh, to get rid of. I, I say, I put this now very black and white. I, I've much realized that. It should not be an easy way to get rid of your loss making infrast uh, and gas infrastructure. Um, that is. Um, one part of the answer. So, um, um, so there is need to separate out a little bit and balance out the interest which uh, play a role between, at the one hand, hydrogen operators and uh, gas network operators. And there's also the question of what kind of rules should apply to this network. This is a question which is in the, lies very much in the future. Um, but. Um, um, I think that there's already now reasons to believe that the rules which should apply to the network are not the ones which uh, are similar to the ones we know from natural gas, but not the same. And part of that, um, I say this also because the the level of integration which the Heiser network probably will have the electricity network in particular, um, both in terms of investment, but also in terms of operational rules will be closer. Um, so I think we should have a network development and the development of the rules which are suitable for hydrogen. And even if the gas pipelines uh, which are repurposed come from the uh, network oper gas network operators which we have today, um, they should be, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they, uh, that we should, um, only play into their hand in terms of how the rules are being set and uh, which pipelines are being repurposed. And that actually connects also to the question with network planning, for instance. Okay, thank you very much. I think that, that clarifies things a lot just in terms of, of why why that uh, uh, separate um, uh, governance structure was, was thought necessary. An interesting question that then that, that sort of Arose internally. Would it then be possible for for a, a TSO company, in theory, to be a member of all three uh, uh, governance structures of of both the ANSOs and of of the newly established this or to be established that, hydrogen? It's not excluded. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I think that's. Uh, that's but of course, uh, the um, the ANSOs and the ANSOs and the NO, or whatever his name will be after the legislative process, um, uh, they all have. Um, a role to play also in the um, in the detailed rule setting of the networks. So they have uh, their, So we should make sure that they can play this role in a way which is, uh, uh, let's say, provides uh, certain guarantees as to the optimal outcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I might hand over to Thijs for for the next question. Sure. Uh, specifically, I, I wanted to 
highlight another, another aspect which was related to, to joint procurement. Of course, that's uh, something that already uh, has some history and it also uh, recently came, came up with, uh, with the gas uh, price uh, crisis. Um, so we noticed there that the proposed legislation, it describes the Commission's role in the me mechanism for joint procure procurement as one of compliance, compliance checking. Um, so the question is, is there a more proactive role that could still be taken at European level to broker joint procurement arrangements uh, between member states or what is exactly uh, that role uh, envisaged? And could you clarify that a bit, please? Uh, I'll be very honest to you. This is, this is not the core of the package which I'm most familiar with. So I, um, the, the question is very interesting, but I'm not sure I can give an intelligent answer to it. Okay, no, no problem. We'll uh, just move on. I um, wanted to ask um, a question regarding uh, energy solidarity. Um, mm -hmm. So the, if that works, uh, the proposed regulation uh, incorporates an explicit reference to the principle of energy solidarity uh, as a criterion for the exemption procedure for a new natural gas and hydrogen infrastructure, reflecting the recent confirmation of the justiciability of energy solidarity by the ECJ, the Court of Justice. Uh, are there other elements of the regulation or the directive in which uh, solidarity is likely to be more influential as a result of the of the ruling? That's a good question. Well, it's not an immediate connection, I think, but uh, I think one of the elements of the of the um, whether which solidarity reappears, but I don't think in exactly the same sense as you mean, relates to the. Uh, Envision of the SOS uh, regulation, security supply regulation. Uh, the previous revision uh, ingrained the idea of solidarity um, the way that uh, in country A, the protected customers were being threatened to be cut off. Um, other countries uh, could switch off certain uses in order to ensure that those vulnerable consumers continue to be supplied. This is, uh, of course, a measure which uh, Actually, is quite innovative also uh, in, in general terms for the kind of uh, collaboration which exists between member states. But of course, in order to work, requires implementation of detailed rules. Under what kind of conditions will the solidarity be provided? And this um, this element of implementation has not really worked as well as we had hoped for. Um, it's difficult to agree on a set of rules uh, where country B is indeed uh, willing to supply this gas and the gas bits price in particular, for instance. Um, and uh, there, we, this package also contains elements to uh, improve on that one, so to improve on the, on the implementation. And what would that mean in, in practice, if you could, uh, could highlight that? Yeah, there's a, um, yeah. Um, so what is the basic idea is that there will be certain rules which will apply by default um, in case of this kind of circumstances. And this doesn't mean that there cannot be negotiations between countries, but there's a kind of template on the, for the conditions under which this solidarity will take place. So, and uh, let's say once you have a default rule which against which you are judged, if you don't agree, the chances that you will eventually agree actually improve significantly because if you don't agree on your terms, you will be confronted with somebody else's terms. Thanks. Uh, Max, I'll, I'll hand over to you, if you want. Sure. Yeah, if, if we do have time for one more question or, uh, or sure. leaves a need a few. Uh, I'll, um, I just one topic I, that struck me is that looking at the legislation, it's, it's much uh, more tied into, I guess, for obvious reasons in the in the sort of governance structure of the energy union, so that uh, national energy and climate plan process uh, laid down by by um, uh, that regulation, in that, for example, um, I think if I understood correctly, uh, national network development plans will now be checked for compliance with uh, with um, with those national plans, um, and and at other points as well, it, uh, the, the sort of procedural element of the governance regulation comes in, um, uh, and. I wanted to ask, um, because the Commission has um, in, in previous communications said that, in fact, the Fit for 55 package as a whole might necessitate a wholesale sort of revision of, of the governance structure uh, uh, 
um, uh, as 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 we go along. And I was one I was wondering, does this gas package, in in your um, view, increase the pressure to update to reform also the overarching governance structure um, uh, in the form of the governance regulation? So first on the element of network planning and how it fits in with uh, with other elements of the governance framework. So. First of all, I should say that uh, under the TANI proposals, which were put forward already last year, there was already a, um, a step forward on the <coughs> the integrated network planning, uh, in particular between gas and electricity. This was work ongoing already between the ENS and so and ENSOC um, to build, uh, to, to make sure that the PCI process and the products which come out of that are really, uh, let's say, Cost effective in the uh, the cost effectiveness is uh, in, is um, evaluated in an integrated way, and <clears throat> but that of course relates to the ten year network development plan on European level. It doesn't relate to the rules which exist on the national level. So indeed, uh, we built we want to build on that. Uh, so um, for instance. Um, uh, let's say the uh, national energy and climate plans. Uh, they contain a pathway of contain a pathway to uh, for decarbonisation, uh, but it was not uh, uh, uncommon that the network plan uh, actually uh, was not compatible uh, with such a national energy and climate plan. Nor, in fact, that the gas and electricity plans were, uh, let's say, mutually compatible with that. And the same problem, of course, will arise with uh, with uh, hydrogen. So we have, we, one of the ideas is to strengthen this link between the scenarios which are used for network planning and the national energy and climate plans. And that um, we render also at a national level the joint assessment of network development obligatory between gas and electricity. Um, and where, although for hydrogen, because it's emerging, we have this possibility, but not yet an obligation to do that. I think uh, there, um, uh, the the level of maturity of the sector requires a bit more prudent approach. Although I think it would be uh, quite uh, interesting to to develop this area further. And now speaking about the future, and I see that because um, especially when you talk about um, uh, electrolyzers as a uh, production method for hydrogen, or there's a strong trade-off between building uh, electricity grids and uh, hydrogen pipelines. And the location of the electrolyzers uh, uh, will be quite important uh, to avoid the congestion electricity side. For instance, and this of course needs to be done in a coordinated way. And there are some elements, okay, now I'm going really into detail, but just to emphasize it a little bit. Um, of course, in the current electricity market design, um, locational signals are uh, done by uh, bidding zone. And uh, within the bidding zone, in most countries, uh, there is no further element which allows you to do uh, to allocate the location of uh, investments. I wouldn't say that there's none, but uh, it's not uh, something we call it. It's not some, It's not part of the market design. I'll say to be like that. Um, so we, um, it's um, there is some reflection needed as to how we make sure that this can, uh, let's say, work uh, properly together. There are there are some elements in the package, also foreseen some other uh, rules which we think around which uh, make this more uh, easier to happen. But of course, also evidently, in any kind of incentive scheme, must, the planning must play, is the, is the first thing which needs to be organized. There's no point in incentivizing something if there's no clue in which direction it needs to be emphasized, uh, incentivized. So metric planning is uh, first step. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that's us out of time. On f is, is that correct? or? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I, I do think we've we've run out of time. If I may, I had one more uh, question, and I think it only requires a short reply. Uh, but this is uh, part of a bigger package, as as was said. Um, it was already presented, or in July we already mm -hmm. had the, the previous proposals under a previous package. 
Now we have again a package of, of three uh, basically proposals related to methane and then the, the gas package. Um, is this also going to go through as a package? Um, does it go through with the previous package or how do you see the process now evolving, evolving in terms of keeping the legislation together just on, on this aspect very quickly? Well, for certain not be easy. Um, um, it is my personal speculation now how things will develop. Um, uh, I think uh, the French presidency, which will come in, um, uh, for example, next year, they will focus on getting a, um, let's say, uh, agreement within the council on the major, on the most major, comp the major components of the July package. So for the energy side, this would be energy efficiency and renewables. Um, we will start discussing the the package which came out uh, yesterday, but um, this will come uh, later. And I think this is also fine because, as I emphasized earlier, the most of the elements of the package which came out in July really relate to incentivization and uh, uh, relative prices between energy carriers. So this has to do with the how we're going to get to the 55 percent whereas the rules we are speaking about they contain some elements of that like for instance uh, the rewrite which are possible in certain conditions for low carbon renewable gases and the methane grid just to mention something but of course this is not the most important important part the part the most the more important part is to make sure that once you know how things are incentivized that it fits together also from an uh, infrastructural and uh, market design point of view. And uh, that uh, can be thought about relatively in an isolated uh, format uh, from the other measures. Perfect, that's very clear, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for um, answering um, the various questions in a, in a very clear and uh, convincing manner and also very comprehensively. Um, I think we've uh, greatly benefited from your your presence with us today um, to, to help us, I think, get our heads uh, around uh, the new package. And I hope that uh, our various audiences at the Florence School and at the College of Europe and uh, in the energy community will, will also benefit greatly uh, from from this uh, talk and and the question and answer sessions. So we really appreciate that you gave us uh, your time, um, especially as everything is is so new, and I'm sure there's uh, at the end of the year such a lot of pressure um, on everybody at the commission to get uh, these proposals up and running. And also, we are exhausted. I can tell you. I'm, I'm sure you are. <laughs> I think the Fit for 55 package sometimes looks like it's um, some sort of uh, boot camp rather than a legislative uh, um, package. On occasion, I'll give you an insight on in what it takes to bring such a package to, to, to the press conference. It's, uh, it's, you, you forget the misery, but you retain the pleasure, the, the sense of uh, achievement. I'll say it a bit like that. That oh, makes it worthwhile. That's good. And that means you'll do it again. <laughs> yeah. Actually, this is the second time because I've done also the uh, electricity market reform. Uh -huh. and exactly because of that, I volunteered for this one. All right. <laughs> and then maybe there'll be a, a hydro, a hydro, car, a hydro, and uh, sorry, an H two O market reform at some point. Uh, well, no, I, I just point yourself to the review clause, which is in the methane uh, rules, which we didn't mm -hmm. discuss, which is in twenty twenty five. I saw that. It's. It's. I was thinking that's very ambitious because it will probably only be adopted and implemented uh, by twenty three at the earliest, uh, and then you have a revision. <laughs> so it's. Uh, Mm -hmm. Indeed, very ambitious. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Uh, maybe I just turn pleasure. to and uh, we wish you lots of luck with uh, getting the the package through. And um, thank you so much for for making your time for us today. Maybe Dirk would like a last and final word. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Uh, I was then indeed. Uh, I think uh, what uh, Lee described as a kaleidoscope, uh, you added uh, a lot of uh, new colors to that. We have got gotten used to the colors when talking about hydrogen. Uh, now, indeed, uh, this colorful picture is uh, being complementary to 
what has been adopted or what has been proposed uh, for electricity and taxonomy. So the Green Deal um, is probably much more than, than green. It really gets a, a very colorful picture and by now um, we just have to make sure we are steady enough not to turn the kaleidoscope uh, every time and get a new picture. Um, and with that, I think now we all get to the actual reading of your proposals. There's a, a winter holiday season coming up, so we'll probably all take that with us to the respective uh, Christmas holidays. And uh, we would like to thank you once again for your readiness on the very day after it was uh, presented, to present it here uh, to our audience. Um, and with this, I think the last thing we can do is to wish everybody a very joyful holiday season and see you all again next year. Thanks a lot, Augustine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.